almost anyone living in the vicinity of the Florida State University campus on that terrible weekend would have heard the sirens of the medic units, been aware that police activity was profound, realized that something more than an accident or a usual investigation was the cause. Henry Palumbo and Rusty Gage, two of the musicians who lived in the Oak, returned to their rooms at 4.45 on Sunday, January 15th, even as the paramedics were carrying Cheryl Thomas to the aid unit a few blocks away. They heard the sirens, but they didn't know what had happened. As Palumbo and Gage walked up the front porch, they saw the man who moved into number 12, a week before, Chris Hagen. He was standing at the front door. They spoke to him, and he said hi. He was staring out in the direction of the campus. They don't remember what he was wearing exactly, but Gage recalled a windbreaker, a shirt, possibly jeans, dark in color, all of it. They don't remember that he seemed nervous or upset. They went upstairs to bed and assumed Hagen had too. By the next morning, as the postmortems began on Lisa Levy and Margaret Bowman, the radio news broadcasts were full of information about the killer in the Chi Omega house, about the attack on Dunwoody Street. There was a shocked gathering of residents in Palumbo's room. They were horrified, and they were discussing what kind of man could have done such a thing. As they talked, Chris Hagen walked in. Chris had never come right out and said what he was doing in Tallahassee. He told them that he had been a law student at Stanford University in Palo Alto, and they assumed he was continuing his studies at Florida State, but he hadn't said it in so many words. He had boasted to them that he knew law very well, and that he was a lot smarter than any policeman. He said, I can't get out of anything, because I know my way around. They put it down to bullshitting. Henry Palumbo remarked that he felt the killer was a lunatic, and was probably lying low as the police investigation accelerated. The others started to agree, but Hagen argued with them. No. This was a professional job. The man has done it before. He's probably long gone by now. Maybe he was right. Hagen said he knew about such things, knew the law, and felt cops were stupid. While the students at Florida State tentatively began their regular routines, moving, especially the co-eds, in a kind of quiet dread, the search for the killer went on. The Leon County Sheriff's Office, the Tallahassee Police Department, and the Florida State Police Department, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, all worked side by side. The streets in and around the campus were staked out constantly by officers sitting quietly in their vehicles, patrolling. After dark, those streets were almost deserted, and all doors were double-locked, blockaded. If it could happen the way it had, in the Cayo House, in the duplex on Dunwoody, could there be safety for any woman in the region? The evidence, handled through a tight chain of evidence so that its progress from the attack sites to the lab at the Florida State Department of Law Enforcement could be tracked exactly, was tested, examined, placed under lock and key. There was a lot of evidence. It would one day take eight hours to log it into the trial, and yet there was so little that could help in the probe as far as leading the investigators to the man they sought. Blood samples, not of the killer, but of the victims, Dr. Wood had deeply excised the section of flesh bearing the teeth marks in Lisa's buttock and refrigerated it in a normal saline solution to preserve it. He personally saw Sergeant Howard Winkler, head of the crime scene unit of the Tallahassee Police Department, take possession of it. In trial, there would be defense arguments that the tissue sample had been improperly preserved, that it had shrunk. It had been taken from the saline solution and placed in formalin. Yet Winkler had photographed the bite marks, to scale with a standard morgue ruler beside them. Whatever shrinking occurred, the scale photos would never change, and a forensic odontologist would be able to match those bite marks to a suspect's teeth, almost as precisely as a fingerprint expert could identify the loops and whorls of a suspect's fingers, if a suspect was ever found. There was the clear all hair mist bottle, stained with type O blood, Lisa's type. There were the two hairs found in the pantyhose mask beside Cheryl Thomas's bed. There were the cards upon cards of latent prints lifted, all of which would prove of no value. The killer apparently knew about fingerprints. There was a wad of chewed gum found in Lisa's hair. Gum that would inadvertently be destroyed in the lab and made useless for testing for secretion or for teeth impressions. There were all the sheets, pillows, blankets, nightgowns, and panties. There were the fragments of the oak bark. But how could one piece of bark be traced to a certain source, even if the death weapon was ever found? 
There were the pantyhose, the Haynes garrote from Margaret's neck, stained deeply with her blood, the Sears brand mask from Cheryl's apartment. That mask would be found to resemble almost exactly the mask taken from Ted Bundy's car when he had been arrested in Utah in August of 1975. There were tests on all the victim's sheets and beddings for the presence of semen. When acid phosphatase is applied to the material, the presence of semen produces a purplish-red stain. There was no semen found on Lisa's, Margaret's, Karen's, or Kathy's sheets. There was, however, a semen stain approximately three inches in diameter on Cheryl Thomas's bottom sheet. Richard Stevens, an expert in serology at the Florida Department of the Law Enforcement's Crime Lab, did intensive testing on that semen stain. Approximately 85% of all human beings are secretors. Enzymes are secreted in bodily fluids, saliva, mucus, semen, perspiration, urine, feces, and these enzymes will tell a serologist what blood type that person has. If a sample of cloth bearing a bodily fluid stain is dropped into a control sample with the same blood type, the sample will not agglutinate. The cells will not clump together. If it is dropped into a control sample of another blood type, there will be agglutination. Stevens' agglutination tests for known blood types all showed cell clumping when the Thomas sheet samples were inserted. The test was inconclusive. Next, he used a process known as electrophoresis. A sample of the semen stained sheet was placed in a starch gel and heated until it took on a jello-like consistency. It was then put on a glass slide and stimulated electrically, causing the proteins to move and a small metabolite was added to show the rates of movement. There was no detectable PGM enzyme activity. It would appear then that the man who ejaculated that semen was a non-secretor Yet to Stevens, the results were inconclusive. There were too many variables that could affect the tests. Age of the stain, condition, the material it was on, environmental factors such as humidity and heat. Also, the rate of secretion varies in individuals depending on the condition of their systems at any given time. Ted Bundy had type O positive blood, and he was a secretor. It was a puzzle. In his trial, the defense would claim that the enzyme tests, the agglutination tests, had proven that Ted could not have left the semen on Cheryl's bed. Perhaps. The prosecution would stress only that Cheryl Thomas could not remember if she had changed her sheets that Saturday, January 14th. Neither side would go a step further, would ask Cheryl if she had had sexual relations with another man in that bed earlier in the week, and the question was left suspended. If Cheryl had not changed her sheets, the inference left unspoken by the prosecution was that the semen stain, the stain where the blood type could not be determined, had been left there by somebody else before the man who bludgeoned her entered the apartment. This stain of ejaculate was one piece of physical evidence that Ted supporters would refer to again and again as proof positive that he was innocent. For a lay jury, it seemed to be a moot point anyway. The scientific testimony would appear to pass over their heads like so much gobbledygook. What the case would come down to was Nita Neary's eyewitness identification of the man in the toboggan cap, the man she saw leaving the Chi Omega house with a bloodstained club, the bite marks in Lisa Levy's flesh, and the hairs in the pantyhose mask. The rest would all be circumstantial. But on January 15th, that was academic. The lawmen didn't even have a suspect, and none of them had ever heard of Theodore Robert Bundy missing now for 16 days from his jail cell in Colorado. Ted still lived at the Oak, and he had stepped up his thefts. With the stolen credit cards, he could eat and drink luxuriously at expensive restaurants in Tallahassee. He could buy items that he needed, but he couldn't figure out a way to get the 320 he needed for his upcoming rent. I was in Los Angeles, still half expecting to see him step out of the shadows in the apartment complex in West Hollywood, still expecting to see his friendly grin. Someone tried to steal my car, pried the whole ignition out of the battered Pinto my producer had rented for me from a rental wreck. When the deputy from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's substation a block away came to take my report, he glanced around my apartment and asked me if I had chosen it myself or if someone had rented it for me. I told him my producers had picked it out. He grinned. Do you know you have the only apartment on this floor that isn't a hooker's pad? No. I didn't, but it explained why there were so many knocks on my door in the wee hours of the morning. Like the FBI men before him, he double-checked my locks and warned me to be careful. 
I could be forgiven for a slight tinge of paranoia. I got another car from rent a wreck and life went on. Florida was a long, long way away. I'd never been there and no plans to ever go there. I received a letter from my mother in Oregon. In it, she enclosed a two-inch clipping, giving the sparsest of details of the Chi Omega murders, and she wrote, It sounds a lot like the Ted murders. I wonder. No, I didn't think so. If Ted had been guilty of the crimes he was accused of in Washington, Utah, and Colorado, and I'd always had great difficulty really believing that, he had made a clean escape. He was free. Why would he jeopardize that freedom, which meant so much to him? The Chi Omega murders, the other attacks, had been different. The work of an almost clumsy, rampaging killer. 